August 1948, and a young preacher named George Vandeman was preparing to take the pulpit. That was 70 years ago, and since that time, Soquel Camp Meeting has convened every summer. In many ways, Soquel embodies America's camp meeting, a timeless tradition of faith intersecting with culture, pleasure with praise, and truth within tradition. Camp Meeting is so valuable we believe it should be shared not just once, but all year long. That is why the Central California Conference leadership team has produced the best of SoCal. Our special made-for-TV editions showcase the best SoCal has to offer, while providing for you the best of SoCal programming from the comfort of your own home. These newly released programs are our gifts to you, and the best part is you don't have to register an RV, pack a suitcase, sleep in a tent, or so much as leave your front door. You can literally go to camp meeting right now from the comfort of that favorite armchair. We invite you today to sit back, relax, let the Holy Spirit in, and enjoy the best of SoCal today. Another story about God using young people in evangelism. California Youth Rush student Will John was standing at a door in Bakersfield, California. The homeowner named Josh smiled politely but said, I'm an atheist. I'm not interested in any of your books. But Will John wanted to understand the young man's views, so he asked him, how did you become an atheist? Josh explained that he had been raised as a believer, but at the age of 18 had become disillusioned with all his unanswered questions and with the apparent inconsistencies in the Bible. Will John asked what some of Josh's questions were, and on the front steps, Will John conducted a short Bible study. At the end, Josh was amazed at how easily Will John had answered his questions and said, you must be a Seventh-day Adventist. I've listened to your local radio station before. Before Will John left, Josh agreed to sign up for more information about the Bible. God uses young people in evangelism. Well, good morning, everyone. I didn't know that was the cue. He'll be here in a few seconds. <laughs> Hello, how's everyone doing today? I see some old friends or young friends. Good to see you all. It's uh, a pleasure to be back here at the SoCal Camp Meeting. This is the best camp meeting, by the way. Anybody agree with that? Such a blessing to be back here. I want to just um, thank you. I, I thoroughly enjoyed myself last year. We had such a good time. Uh, over in that little room. Oh, what a time we had. I do want to thank the Central California Conference for inviting me back to be here. Also want to thank uh, Dr. Steve Horton uh, for his vision for this whole health outreach. I'm sure he's not the only one, but it's, I think it's powerful, don't you? It's a wonderful thing with the Life Hope Centers, what they're doing. So praise the Lord for that. I want to thank also Dr. Arlene Taylor, who we just heard from. Amen? Amen? Thank her for her vision for us doing this together. This was sort of out of my, my uh, comfort zone, but you know, I've been, been learning that we have to get out of our comfort zone and get into the comforter zone. Did anybody hear what I just said? Into the comforter zone. So this was not really where I'm as comfortable talking about the brain per se, However, as I began to study the things that she was recommending in terms of emotional intelligence, oh my, what a field. I am convinced that Christians, definitely Seventh-day Adventists, ought to be the most emotionally intelligent people on the planet. Did you hear what I just said? We should be the most emotionally intelligent on the planet, I'll share with you why as I go through this presentation this morning. Now, I'm going to be using the King James Version of the Bible. I need to let you know that. As I was growing up there in the, the mean streets of Washington, D.C., um, I used to sit home and I would read Shakespeare for fun. Was that you too? We were weird. Yes. So. <laughs> I used to read Shakespeare for fun, and I got so used to the language that I have a hard time reading any other Bible. 
Now, so if I use King James, it doesn't mean that I am in any way uh, ad, uh, opposed to the Bible that you use. No, not at all. I just happen to like the language. It's so poetic to me. Amen? So we're going to be talking about emotional intelligence versus artificial intelligence. So let's get started. And I'm supposed to have a little bit of audio. There you go. Now, you remember last year, last year when I was here, um, I would like to start, I always started with a song. Anybody remember that? You all were sitting and listening to a presentation. I, I, I cannot do any other. I must sing my theme song. So we have to do it quickly because I don't have a lot of time. Can you stand up and sing with me? Jesus is coming soon. How many of you believe that? Do you still believe it? Then let's sing together. I'll lead you. Here we go. Sometimes are here, filling his hearts with fear. Freedom we all hold dear. Now is that stay. Humbling your hearts to God. Saints in the chastity rock. Seek the way pilgrims try. Christians away. Why? Because Jesus is coming soon. Morning or night. soon be all happy forevermore when we meet on that show free from all care rising up in the sky rising up in the sky tell the world this world goodbye homeward we then we fly glory to glory share to share cause Jesus, Jesus is coming soon Jesus is coming soon, morning or night or noon, many will meet their doom, trumpets will sound, all of the dead shall rise, righteous be in the sky, going where no one dies, everywhere by One more time, Jesus is coming soon, morning or night or noon. Trumpets will sound, all of the dead shall rise, righteous be in the sky, going where no one dies, heaven were Amen, amen. You may be seated. Oh, you sounded as, just as good as you did last year. Praise the Lord. Now, Today I'm dealing with artificial intelligence versus emotional intelligence, but the overall theme, the portion that I'm going to be covering as I partner with Dr. Arlene Taylor on this, the portion that I'm responsible for, the theme is let this mind be in you. Let this mind be in you, which of course is taken from Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. What is the mind of Christ. That's the continuation of the text. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Have you ever considered what was on Jesus' mind? Do you want that mind? Do you have that mind? Paul says you have the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ. We want to explore that. 
Now, there are some questions that we want to answer, some essential questions that we want to answer. We'll probably answer more than these just as we go through the discussion, but these are the three questions to be answered. What was the divine purpose in the creation of man? What was actually lost in the fall of man? How will God restore that which was lost? How will he restore it? Have you asked yourself these questions? May we answer them today. Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come and to share and to learn and to study the mind of Jesus. Now, Father, we just ask that you would come and draw very close to us. For if anything is to take place in this auditorium, it will not be by might nor by power, but by your spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. And we touch and agree, Lord, to claim the promise that if we being evil know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more shall our heavenly Father give the gift of the Holy Spirit to them that ask? We are asking, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you have your Bibles, do you have your Bibles? Turn with me to Genesis chapter 2, and I'm going to read a text there, and we're going to look at that text and then come back at the end and look at that text again. We're going to unpack it, but we're going to read it just to get started. Genesis chapter 2 and beginning in verse 18. You know that the first 3,000 years of earth's history are found in the book of Genesis. The first 3,000 years. And we find that if we want to understand something, we have to start in Genesis, where everything began. And I believe that emotional intelligence began there. Emotional intelligence began there. I'll talk more about it, the things that I've learned, and the things that you and I should know about emotional intelligence, as Dr. Arlene Taylor talked about. Are you there in Genesis chapter 2 and beginning in verse 18? The Bible says, and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. Who determined that man should not be alone? God did. God determined that man should not be alone. He says, I will make him and help me for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helpmeet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh there instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. This this series of Bible texts, this creation story, this story of the making of man is so power-packed. It's so power-packed. I should mention to you that as it pertains to emotional intelligence, emotional intelligence, it connotes, it suggests that it has something to do with what? Your emotional state. Your emotional state. But we want to go much deeper. Now, you would think it would be intuitive for me to start talking about what is emotional intelligence. Break that down. Unpack that for us first. But since artificial intelligence is such a headline, I'm going to start there. Because many of us are already, in some way or another, enjoying artificial intelligence, aren't we? Your smartphones. I hope your intelligence isn't artificial. I hope it's real. But many of us are enjoying artificial intelligence as we go about our daily routine. Now, first of all, at the Dartmouth Conference, at the Dartmouth Conference in 1955, a mathematician by the name of John McCarthy, 
he was the one who sort of framed this idea of artificial intelligence. In fact, as they were pursuing how could they simulate the mind of man, at the 1955 Dartmouth conference, this particular gentleman uh, who was brilliant in this field, he actually said something, and I'm going to read this quote to you. He said, every aspect of learning or any other feature of intelligence can in principle be so precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate it. An attempt will be made to find how to make machines use language, form abstractions and concepts, solve kinds of problems now reserved for humans and improve themselves. How about that? This was about 62 years ago, and they found that there were like seven areas that they wanted to break down. Here are the seven areas. Number one, simulating higher functions of the human brain as was just read to you. Number two, programming a computer to use general language. That has been accomplished. Number three, arranging hypothetical neurons. Can you imagine that? Hypothetical neurons, brain cells, in a manner so that they can form concepts. Number four, a way to determine and measure problem complexity. This has been achieved. Number five, also achieved self-improvement through algorithms and through learning software. Your software, your phone is learning how you operate. It's pretty scary, isn't it? Self-correct. Self oh, it's terrible. Have you ever seen the autocorrect on your phone? That's some artificial intelligence, isn't it? One guy was trying to say, say to someone that he was married and he kept saying he was martyred. He finally said, you know what? This thing, this intelligence is really working. <laughs> Number six, abstraction defined as the quality of dealing with ideas rather than events. And how about this? Number seven, randomness and creativity. Randomness and creativity. Now, here's the thing. This would blew my mind. Did you know that already artificial intelligence can compose music Piano, guitar, string instruments, if then, then that, if this, then that. Through coding, they're actually able to write music, write poetry. Some of the news headlines and blurbs that you read actually have been written by artificial intelligence. In fact, Deep Blue was a computer that actually dethroned the world-renowned chess champion Gary Kasparov. Deep Blue, he said it cheated, but it beat him in six games. Amazing, right? What is intelligence? Well, surely you all know what that is, right? According to Jack Copeland, professor of philosophy at the University of Canterbury in New Zealand, he gave five areas, generalization, learning, number two, Reasoning, number three, obviously problem solving, number four, perception, and number five, language understanding. In the simulation of minds, man's mind, this is the description and the goal of AI, to do these five things. Now, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about what is emotional intelligence. Let's get into that just a little bit. Emotional intelligence. What is emotional intelli intelligence? Well, Harvard Business, Re Business Review calls it the key to professional success. The key to professional success. And basically, emotional intelligence in the 1990s was sort of coined by two researchers, Peter Salovey and John Mayer, and they co coined that term emotional intelligence, describing it as, listen to this very carefully, a form of social intelligence that involves the ability to monitor one's own and others' feelings. You're going to have to really capture the definition because I'm coming back to it. It's going to be the basis of how I'm going to go to Scripture. 
and began to see that this is what God's people need to understand. Because it's interesting to me that while, as Daniel chapter 12 says, that knowledge shall be increased, we're beginning to see that while all this artificial intelligence is burgeoning, is blooming, it's advancing rapidly, so is our understanding of emotional intelligence. God n never leaves us without, never leaves us without. So I'm going to read that part again for you. It says, a form of social intelligence. Ellen White calls our ability to be social, she calls it social power. She says the, the people of God ought to have social power. A form of social intelligence that involves the ability to monitor one's own and others' feelings and emotions, to discriminate among them, and to use this information to guide one's thinking and action. In one study by Salovey and Mayer, individuals who scored higher in the ability to perceive accurately, understand, and appraise others' emotions were better able to respond flexibly to changes in their social environments and build supportive social networks. Are you beginning to see why this almost sounds like a description of God's people? The ability to have an understanding of how they feel, but how they feel about others' emotions, taking into consideration others. Being self-aware, I think Sister Taylor brought that out as well. Daniel Goldman learned of Salovey and Mayer's work, and it led to his seminal book entitled Emotional Intelligence. It was Goldman who argued that it was not cognitive intelligence that guaranteed business success, but emotional intelligence. He also outlined five areas that we should take a look at. They are knowing your emotions, being in, tough, in touch with how you feel. Number two, managing your emotions, including the ability to suppress negative feelings. Hello. Hello. Think back to, the, to that board meeting when someone just couldn't stop. Oh, we have to make it practical. We have to make it real. Recognizing, see, here's the thing. Let me just throw this in there. You know, as I go around and I share the health message and I talk about what things we need to do to eat and so forth and how to keep the brain healthy, keep the body healthy, and I must tell you, since I last saw you, I've been to several countries, I've been all around and telling people this wonderful message of health. And here's what I have found, that as people begin to adopt a healthy lifestyle, it doesn't necessarily change their negative attitudes. Have you heard this? Vegans can be some of the meanest people. <laughs> and I've seen it. I've seen it. So I began to say, it's, it's, it, the diet helps, but there's something else. And as we come and gather for camp meeting, we have to begin to look at what things can we begin to do to really begin to have the mind of Christ. Recognizing emotions in others, managing relationships, motivating ourselves to achieve goals. So those just stuck out to me, recognizing how God feels. How often do we think about how Jesus feels? How often do we take survey of how we feel about him? God is a relational being. He's a relational God, and he desires to have a relationship with, with us, and he wants us to know him as one who absolutely is crazy about you. Are we crazy about him? The man who came to Jesus and said, you know, how should I read the law? What's the most important aspects of the law? And Jesus asked him, he says, how do you read the law? He says, well, to love your God with all your heart and all your soul, all your mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. He says, you've got it. That's it. We can talk about all these things, but it really just simply comes down to, do you love God? And do you love his creation?
Greetings and welcome to the Best of SoCal. My name is Romero Cano, President of the Central California Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. The Pin of Inspiration shares the following. The camp meeting is one of the most important agencies in our work. It is one of the most effective methods of arresting the attention of the people. Volume 6 of Testimonies, page 31. The Central California Conference has had a very long tradition with our annual camp meeting ministry. We can trace it back for over 138 years in our conference territory. For the last 70 years, camp meeting has been held in our conference center in Soquel, California, near Santa Cruz. Camp meeting continues to be a transformative blessing embodying old-fashioned tent revival evangelism while simultaneously sharing God's Word through a variety of inspirational and riveting speakers. Last year alone, the Soquel Camp Meeting pulpit was host to over 71 hours of live television broadcasting for both local and streaming to a worldwide church community of more than 96 countries, transporting the hope of God's soon return and the comfort of Christ's love to the furthest places of the world. It is my honor and my privilege to make the best of Soquel available to you. At the same time, I invite you to become part of the Soquel legacy by partnering with us in our evangelism fund. Each year, Soquel camp meeting goers collect funds to propel evangelism in a variety of ways. To do so, go to Central California Conference's homepage, centralcaliforniaadventist.com. Even a dollar a day is of great value to God's work. These gifts are 100% for evangelism. We invite you to also download our app, CCC Space SDA. Through it, you can enjoy many video sermons. We also have a prayer wall where you can submit a prayer request. So dear friends, wherever you are today, I invite you to sit back, let the Holy Spirit lead, be transformed by the message, the prayers and the testimony segments. Catch and enjoy the best of SoCal. Another story about God using young people in evangelism. Kelly was a California Youth Rush student visiting homes in the heat of summer. On this particular day, people were giving her large contributions toward her Christian education at the academy where she attends, but they were refusing the books that she offered in return. She wanted to help someone spiritually by leaving a spiritual book. At one door, a man named Greg instantly refused her books when he discovered that her books were of a spiritual nature. He said to her, my father committed suicide last year because he had committed a sin. He felt he had committed a sin that God could not forgive. I want nothing to do with a God like that. Kelly looked at Greg and shared a testimony of God's love and forgiveness in her own life. She appealed to him to open his heart to God. After a moment of struggle, Greg finally agreed to let Kelly pray with him. She left him with the book Steps to Christ, and when she left it, he had new light in his eyes. God uses young people in evangelism. Managing relationships with him and with others. Are we motivated to even begin to receive this great goal of letting the mind of Christ be in you? Oh, I like this part. So what are we talking about when it comes to AI? artificial intelligence. They call it AI. Many of us are already using it. Like I said, we love it. Some are using Siri. Some are using Google, uh, what is it called? Uh, Google Assist and Alexa and others are coming onto the market. And it's amazing. People have relationships. <laughs> people have relationships with these things. You know, they, I, I don't have to tell you this. How many people do you see often just like this having that relationship? Right? The thing that we don't understand is the more we actually have relationships, the thing about the human mind is the more we relate to something, the more we become like it. You follow that? Okay, so what are we talking about here? Is this what's coming? Cyborgs? You're going to go to the grocery store and a cyborg is going to check you out? 
scan your items, huh? Zap you if you bring too many items into the express lane, right? Or is it more like this is already here? Now, I'm, I'm bummed, I got to tell you. I had a video that was so amazing. This was, this is Sophia. Sophia is a social robot. She was on The Tonight Show, and we couldn't show it because we're broadcasting and so forth. But you, sh you should go to YouTube, look it up. She was on The Tonight Show, and basically she carried a full-on conversation with Jimmy Fallon. Told jokes, got laughs, played games, could actually carry a full-on discussion with a human being. It's here. And the sad thing, listen, friends, the sad thing is we are moving so far away from genuine, real, personal relationships, and we're relating to things like machines. See, the machines, the robots, are being made in the image of man. But if man is devoid of God, then whose image are they really being made in? Is this just another distraction to move us away from what's important? Who's important? The relationship, the ultimate relationship that we should have? Did you know that you can actually hire a personal cuddler? Some of you are looking at me like, what in the world are you talking about? Personal cuddlers, they charge you about 5 to $10 an hour. They come and they will cuddle with a person who doesn't want any type of physical relations. They just come and make you feel better by cuddling with you. It's taken off in Japan where marriage is way, way down. People don't get married anymore. They just hire a cuddler. You can buy, you can purchase for about $60,000. Sophia, a robot like her and she'll be your girlfriend or your bride. I'm just telling you, I don't make this stuff up. So, the divine purpose in the creation of man. What is the divine purpose in the creation of man? God said, listen, God said, let us make man in our own image. Let us. Ooh, that's a small word with a lot of power. A small, a tiny word with a lot of power. That word there in the, the Old Testament, let, L-E-T, is the Hebrew word, haiva. Haiva. To be, to become, to exist, to happen. In the New Testament, in the Greek, it's phreneo. Phreneo, meaning to have understanding, to be wise, to be of the same mind. So when it says, let this mind be in you, it's saying, be wise, have understanding, to be harmonious with someone, to direct one's mind to a certain thing, to cherish the same views. Powerful word. This, this blows my mind because when you consider that when God said, let there be, he uses it quite a bit in, in Genesis chapter 1, he says, let there be. And when he says, let, as soon as that word comes out of his mouth, subatomic particles, elements, they all stand at the ready waiting for the description of what to become. He says, let there be light. And the Bible says, and it was so. Powerful. He says, let there be a firmament. And then 78% of nitrogen, 21% oxygen, 0.9% uh, of argon, all moved the waters apart, apart, and they became a firmament. It was so. He says, let the water bring forth dry ground. Oh, that one. I love reading the book of Genesis. Because I just go into my sanctified imagination, I say, the earth came out of the ground, and I said, well, it must have been wet, but the earth remembered the command, and it said, moisture, you have to leave because we have to be dry. And it became dry ground. Whatever he says, let the elements, the subatomic particles, they cooperate. God is waiting for the power of let to take place with this mind. Let this mind be in you. So we have to figure out, we have to understand, how do we get this mind? That's the question. 
Psalm 38, 33, verse 8 and 9 tells us, Let the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. But what about when it came to man? What about when it came to man? He says, let us. Now, I, I, I thought about that one. Just I thought about that. I said, God commanding himself? What happens when God says, let us do something? It's like double the power. It's like, it's like that ice cream that they have down there. But then, that's power enough. I like ice cream. But then adding all of the toppings on it, double the power, extra. Or oh, I went to the Caribbean recently. This was double the power. I got 50% off on a fare all the way to the Caribbean. Only to get there and find out that I had gotten the upgrade to first class. I was like, that's extra. Double the power. When God made Adam, he said it was very good. Extra power. Extra power. Let us make man in our own image. What is the image? What is the image? Oh, this is so beautiful to me. The image of God. He says, I have created him for my glory. Isaiah 43, 7. I made Adam for my own glory. Now, image, name, and glory all mean one thing in the Bible. Do you know what it is? Character. They all mean character. In other words, he says, I've made Adam for my own character, my own likeness. What does that mean exactly? We need to understand what that means. God wanted us to know something that's much deeper. You know, to help us understand character, that word character, the one time that we get a, the clearest understanding of character is when Moses had this question. He wanted to know, what are you like? What's on your mind, God? And he asked God in Exodus chapter 33 and verse 18, he says, Lord, show me your glory. Show me what you're like. Now watch this. This is, this is so beautiful to me. He says, show me what you're like. And then God, can you go there with me very quickly? Exodus chapter 33. When you're there, say amen. Show me thy glory. Exodus chapter 33 and verse 18. He asked him, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And I want you to see what God says in verse 19. He says, and he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name, there it is, character of the Lord, before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. In other words, he says, God, show me what you're like, and God puts it in a context of a relationship. When I'm working with my creation, I show mercy to whom I will show mercy. Isn't that wonderful? Now, he should have been saying that because something just happened. Back there in chapter 32, something just happened, and we cannot overlook what just happened. It is something that we must understand because then it makes it so much more special to us what just took place. Why God would say, I will show mercy unto those who, I will show mercy and grace to those whom I will show grace. Anybody need grace today? Anybody thankful for the grace and mercy of God? Amen. Amen. Well, you know what happened. Moses went up in the mountain, and shortly thereafter, they were out having a party. And Moses came down, broke the commandments, and then in Exodus chapter 34 and verse 1, it says, take those, go get two more tables of stone, and let's start all over again. I don't know about you all, but I just love God, that about God. I love that about Jesus. You messed up. We can start again. I'm a God of second chances. Oh, I know you all don't need another chance. You all are so perfect. 
Don't need any more chances. But if you ever do need a chance, another one, just know that God is a God of multiple chances. Amen? He told Moses, look, I can't show you. Listen to this. Have you ever considered this? He said, Moses, I, I can't show you my face because you wouldn't live. So I'm going to have to hide you. I'm going to have to cover you. I'm going to have to cover you in the cleft of the rock. That's who God is. See, if you want to know what he's like, he's the God who covers you. How do you feel about that? I'm checking your emotional intelligence. How do you feel about that? How do you manage the feelings of a God who says, I don't want you to get hurt, Moses. I'm going to cover you. He goes on and says, the Lord, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and in truth. He gives his characteristics. He shows what he's like, and they needed it. Do you know why they needed it so much? Because his wife had just stepped out on him. Did you hear what I said? His wife, after he took her hand in marriage, stepped out on him. You all looking at me strange. You say, where is he getting that from? Go to Jeremiah 31 and verse 32. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 32. Very quickly, because my time, this, this clock is, is not nice at all. I have no time for nuances. Are you there? Notice what it says in Jeremiah 31, 32. I got to read it whether you're there or not. It says, not according, listen to this, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand. I like that language. Took them by the hand in marriage. I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband to them. I was a husband to them. I, I began to wonder. I was like, wow, is this a part of the image of God? Is this who he is? That, that when we look at the glory of God, the image of God, the only way that we can understand the depth of this kind of bond is he has to put it in the context of a marriage relationship? You better believe it. So I wondered. I said, was it just Israel that became the, the, the wife of God? Could we have said this about, about Adam? I think we could. Notice with me in that same book, no, not the same book, Isaiah chapter 40, 54 and verse 5. Turn there very quickly. Great, you're there. I'm, I'm going to begin reading, begin reading in verse 4. It says, Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither be thou confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame. For thou shalt, for, shalt forget the shame of thy youth, and shalt not remember the reproach of the widowhood anymore. For thy maker is thy husband. Thy maker is thy husband. And in Isaiah chapter 43 in verse 1, he says, Look, Jacob, Israel, you are mine. How many of you are married out there? Have your sweetie ever told you, you know what? You're mine. Or maybe at Valentine's Day he said, or she said, will you be mine? God says you're mine. How does that make you feel about God? God loves us. But when Adam came from the creator's hand, he bore in his physical, mental, and spiritual nature a likeness to his maker. God created man in his own image, and it was his purpose that the longer man lived, the more fully he should reveal this image. The more fully he would understand the oneness of the relationship between himself and God. Tomorrow, I'm going to deal with fear. We're talking about fear tomorrow because fear damages relationships. 
It was the fear that came over Adam and Eve once they sinned that caused them to hide from God. And many of us, we want health, but we're sometimes hiding from God, afraid of God. The last warning message to a dying world is a revelation of God's character of love, according to Christ's object lessons. This thing that we're all dealing with is a misapprehension. We don't think it's happening in our church, but there's a fear of God even among Seventh-day Adventists. And I've discovered that we can never, ever fully have health as long as we're scared of God. Satan is a counterfeiter, and he's seeking to create man in his own image. Those are not my words. Notice this. He came into the garden. The thing that he stole, he stole this image, this glory, this character from man. He, Satan, well knows that it is impossible for man to discharge his obligation to God and to his fellow men while he impairs the faculties which God has given him. That's why the health message is so important. I read, I read in Sister White's writing, she says that when we eat the, the, the flesh of animals, we take on their character. She, in fact, she says of the dumb beast. Now, this confused me. Because I said, I've met a lot of really super intelligent meat eaters. I have. So have you. But then it occurred to me as I was studying emotional intelligence, it affects the emotional intelligence. I don't know what the problem is with vegans. I don't know. Can't say. It's already mean. I don't know. So why, why, why does Satan want to come and actually attack man's mind? Listen to this very carefully. For thousands of years, Satan has been experimenting upon the properties of the human mind, and he has learned to know it well. By this, his subtle workings in these last days, he is linking the human mind with his own. Oh, boy, that caused you to pause, doesn't it? to link his mind with ours. This is why in these last days, I think that Seventh-day Adventists are to be the most emotionally healthy people on the planet. I believe on our job, people should say there's really something different about them. At school, we, we, should, we, should, we should present ourselves as people who just seem to just know the person who is our God. And we are reflecting him. Whatever we do, sometimes, I, I tell you one time, I called someone up, and they came on the phone, and they were just so harsh, and they said, well, what, what do you want? And it was an Adventist. I was like, whoa. So I said, this is, you know, I introduced myself, and I said, I'm the Adventist brother. Oh, hey, brother, how are you? <laughs> Switch just like that. So I want to say, all right, so you're mean to other people, but you're nice to Adventists. Ah. Uh, can I really do this in two minutes? No. But here's why. Here's what he's doing. The great deceiver hopes to confuse the mind, minds of men and women that none but his voice will be heard. Oh, friends, we ought to stop and take pause and understand what's really taking place. I tell you, if we are not growing deeper in love with Jesus and reflecting that self-sacrificing love, that oneness, then I'm not sure. I'm, 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 as Whitley Phipps said, I'm so tired of burying mean Adventists. Let me see if I can bring out a few other points here. So what God wants to do is he wants to restore in us the image of God. I love this quote, and it follows something Dr. Arlene Taylor said several times in her presentation, that according to Feelings 101, that's in her presentation, feelings always follow thoughts. Feelings always follow thoughts. Now, this is powerful. Watch this. If the thoughts are wrong, the feelings will be wrong. And the thoughts and feelings combined, they make up the moral character, right? So where do we see this best? We see this in the creation of Adam. 
How many of you believe, now I'm going to test your emotional intelligence quotient one more time. How many of you believe that Adam actually named the animals by a show of hands? Okay, let me, let me do the follow-up question to that. How many of you believe that when Adam named the animals, he named them based on, based on his own intelligence and what he knew? Show me your hands. Now, there was one woman I was sharing this whole idea, and she got so upset with me because, because since cradle roll, she had been taught that Adam named the animals. Spirit of Prophecy says that, but notice this. When God made Adam, this right here is what you see is the first automobile that the world ever had. Wouldn't you like to have one of those? When it's really hot outside? <laughs> or in the winter time, right? <clears throat> now, what took place? When, when they made the first automobile, what do you think they did? They took it for a test drive. Follow me, follow what I'm, follow the, 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 the logic here. So when God made Adam, and the Lord said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him an helpmeet. So God made man a helpmeet, and he fashioned him. He said, let us make man, and then therefore he makes this man and begins to test his mind. Now, you don't have to agree with me, but when those two elephants came along, see, it was much deeper. See, Intelligence is one thing, but emotional intelligence is everything. And what God really wanted to happen was he wanted Adam to look at those two elephants and say, Whoa, those are two elephants. They look so happy together. And God says, Yes, Adam, that's what I call them. And then he saw those two eagles, and he says, Look at those two eagles. They're so paired up, and they look so happy together. Yes, Adam, that's what I call them. How about those cute Tigers, Bengal tigers, by the way. Look at the female one. She's smiling. <laughs> Those are tigers, Lord. And God says, that's what I call them, Adam. And then God sat back and he waited. And then Adam says exactly what God says. He says, it's not good for me to be alone. That's his own emotional intelligence kicking in. Where's my date? Where's my companion? You don't have to trust me. This was from A.T. Jones as I wrap this up. A.T. Jones, the testing of the mind. I found this and it blew me away. It says, the creation of man, the making of mind, was the crowning of creation. Therefore, the mind of man is the highest created means of reflecting, representing, of expressing the thought of God. Then he says, note the divinely given illust illustration of this. When God had made the man alone, he caused to pass before him all the beasts and the files to see what he would call them. Not as many misread it to have him give names to them, but in truth to see what he would call them. Will he call them the very thing that's in my mind? Was there ever a time that God didn't know something? Absolutely. He always knew. So, but in truth to see what he would call them, it was a test of the mind of man. By the way, Ecclesiastes 6.10 says, that which hath been is named already. Uh, let me say that again. That which hath been is named already. And it is known to God. In fact, the Bible says in Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done. So God knows the end from the beginning. So therefore, he knew what the animals were. But deeper than that, the conclusive test was the moral character because thoughts and feelings combined, they make up our spiritual nature. And what is our spiritual nature? How do you take a man and a woman and say they're one? If you peer into the conversation of Jesus in John chapter 17, when he's pleading his heart to his father, he says, Father, glorify me with the glory that I had with you before the earth began. When we were 
one. I would that they would be one even as we are one. This is what his character is. Oh, if we could be one. You know, God is just waiting for us to say we're one, to act like we're one. We believe the same thing. We have the same love, the same mind, the mind of Christ. That's what I'd like to see. Amen? Amen? Notice the conclusion. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now, the commentary says they don't think this is prophetic. Whether it's prophetic and Adam said it or whether God said it, the conclusion remains the same. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. How do you feel about that today? How do you feel about that? How do you feel about the fact that Jesus had the closest companion in heaven with his father? And Adam, I'm sorry, Jesus left that close companion and he came and he wrapped his arms around his bride, the church. When Adam said this or recognized this, God said, we have a winner. We have made him in our image. image. He understands the oneness of his God, the relational aspect of God. Do you want that oneness today? We have four more days. This is all foundation. We're going to talk about what breaks up that closeness. What tears apart and really doesn't give us peace, stresses us out. We're going to look at the part of the brain tomorrow in the title of the presentation, Fear Not, Amygdala. Some of you know what that is. That's the fear part of the brain. How did God give us a fear area in our brains and yet tells us 63 times in the Bible, don't fear. Don't fear. Friends, Jesus is our husband. God the Father is our husband. He's our lover. He's our special lover. So much so that he died for his bride. We want to realize this with our heart. As it says in Zechariah chapter 12, that we need to, as a people, for our dull senses to acknowledge what we have done to our husband. Once we do that, oh, that quotient is going to go up. And we'll start to reflect it to the world. Pray with me. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for Jesus, our husband. We thank you, Lord, that as we look at the mind of Christ and allowing this mind to be in us, Lord, help us to understand your mind. The mind is so closely related to the heart. Help us, dear God, to understand the heart of God. And we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. We would like to thank the constituency of the Central California Conference of the Seventh-day Adventist Church for making this program possible and from viewers just like you. Thank you.